morning, we're at Lajisim Malaysia 2024, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Charles Brewer, CEO of Post Malaysia. Thank you very much for meeting with us. You're welcome, Erica. Um, just briefly, and I know we just covered this a little bit, could you give a background? You've been everywhere on yeah. yourself before we go into a bit about yeah. Post Malaysia. So they nicknamed me the International Man of Mystery because I've been to, so, I think I've been to a hundred and, I've been to about 115 countries now. And uh, still, I think there's still like 60 or 70 still to go, but I've worked on every continent uh -huh. and been back in Malaysia since August 2021. So I've been back here for a few years, my third time living here. I was going to say, how many tours have yeah, you Yeah, third time. And my wife's Malaysian, so naturally I have to love it. It's a great place, great, great country. Uh, it is, it yeah. is beautiful. And, and Post Malaysia has a pretty interesting background, again, for an international audience. People think post office, governmental agency. Give us a little bit about Post Malaysia, their structure, size, history. Yeah, so everything, everything in life Life has two sides of the coin, yeah. So on the positive side, yeah, like you say, Post Malaysia is a really amazing company. We, we're more than 200 years old. The very, very first letter was sent out of Penang um, or 220 years ago by an English sailor back to the UK, sent via India. It took about 12 and a half years to get there, I think. Um, so a long, long, long time ago. And, and like all, po there are 190 odd postal operators uh, in the world, and like all postal operators, we're going through a significant transformation, a huge, huge, huge transformation. Um, and you know, as we talk about quite regularly, what got us there yep. today it won't get us there tomorrow. So we need to really transform and be relevant for what yep. we want to be tomorrow. So massive transformation, lots and lots of work streams, lots of hard work. I was about 20 years younger when I started this three years ago. Um, <laughs> it's been a bit of stress, but a lot of fun too. I mean, it's, you've it's, lost it's, a lot of weight. I lost a lot. Of, I've <laughs> yeah. been working hard on that. But uh, thank you very much. But um, but yeah, no, it's it's hard hard yards. And but all postal operators, not just post manager, all postal operators are going through this significant yep. transformation. And. Uh, has its ups and has its downs, but a little bit challenged, but it's for the most part quite good fun. And there's other, I mean, Post Malaysia has diversified. Yeah. Um, there's probably some other entities. Would you mind sharing with us? Yeah, we do some really cool things. So yeah. aside, we do, I mean, you know, like I, like I said, most people sort of assume that we don't do letters so much or any post operator's letters, but we still do a million plus letters a day. Um, so a lot of letters covering more than 11 million addresses. And that's right at the core of what we do, delivery. Yeah? So that's really key to us. And then of course, parcel with the advent of e-commerce over the last sort of 10, 12, 15 years, parcel has grown really quickly it's really competitive here. Yep. it's a very very competitive space with a lot of new players coming in almost every week um, but there's and the markets around about 50 million parcels a month so it's a big parcel Still market e-commerce population or sort of parcels per capita is around seven parcels per year per person my wife does that in a day by the way um, so she, <laughs> she, <not> tips, <laughs> she tips that average up quite significantly but to your point you know and a little bit before, even before I started, but we've been sort of carrying on in that fashion. You need to diversify, you know. So, like I said earlier, what got us here won't get us there tomorrow. So, we have a number of other business units. We yep. have the, the big ones. We have Post Logistics, which includes two ships, uh, amongst oh, other things. Ships owned, yeah, owned we do. By Post yeah. Malaysia. Oh, fantastic. We do. We move coal uh, backwards and forwards between Indonesia and here, and sometimes to Australia, by the way. Um, so, we, we do a lot of those sort of and, and all the usual sort of logistics activities yep. from warehousing, road haulage, air freight, sea freight, etc. So that's one division that we have that sort of uh, has helped us diversify. But one that one that sort of captures a lot of interest is we have a, a division called Post Aviation. Yeah, so, I was hoping you would get to that. <laughs> yeah, so we do about 11 million meals a day. Oh. Uh, so every time you get on a plane, that person comes along and says chicken or fish. Uh, that's us. We, not us that says that. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> not us that actually delivers it, but we do we do cook it. Mm. And sometimes they've even helped out. I wouldn't tell you which flights in case you get any sort of food poisoning. But we so we do we do about 11 million meals a day um, and we do all the cargo check-in also the check-in for people cargo load and unload so a lot of activities after the airports and KLA and others um, so that keeps us very very busy and then most recently um, as part of our transformation of Post Malaysia we have four new business units which include a digital arm where we're sort of um, uh, selling our software as a service solutions to other companies um, we've got an international arm uh, where we're developing a hybrid international cross-border product. We're developing um, our retail footprint. So we have about 4.7 million square foot of retail space in Malaysia, which is in top five, uh, top five in Malaysia. But what, you know, we get about 1.5 million people coming in every single month, yep, yep. Uh, which is a lot. But what they used to come in for, they can do on their phone in many cases now. So that's changing too. So repurposing that retail footprint 
And as I mentioned, the one that sort of gets uh, a lot of a lot of commentary is is our convenience store, which is called Post Shop, yep. which has the most amazing ice cream, by the way, and cheesecake. Go and try it. Tell Charles sent you can have it for free. Is, is uh, this, I, I hate to interrupt, but is this part of the Basque Bear? I, I saw that we have Basque Bear Basque in Bear. there, so we yeah. have other other brands uh, selling their products okay, in our retail yeah. footprint. But these one, this one is actually ours. Okay. Uh, and think convenience store, so bread, okay. water. Okay. Cup noodles, whatever whatever it is, you can come and get all of those from us. But as I said, most importantly, get some really great ice cream and great cheesecake. I will and, definitely uh, check that. We have about 16 of those now, with a plan to have 60 by the end of this okay. year, and another 400 odd next year. So, uh, and all of these things we're doing with a view to de-risking, uh, mitigating that sort of male, that shift yeah. in male, that structural change in male, uh, de-risking the very competitive parcel market, and finding new value creators that makes sense for post Malaysia going forward. And so far, um, with a greater or less extent, so far all ticking the right boxes, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, going back, I know your background is hugely in e-commerce, yeah. and I know over the years that's where a lot of the global post postal services yep. have ventured out into the e-commerce. But, and maybe you can't be at liberty to answer this, but who do you see or what do you see as the biggest uh, competitors or threats maybe to post Malaysia? at this point in time? I mean, I, I think it'll change. Yep. So what I'm going to tell you, I think is not necessarily fixed in time. Yep. I think this, this has got several more twists and turns yep. to go. And if you go back about seven or eight, nine years ago, when sort of e-commerce really started to take off, I think most postal operators saw the platforms, you know, the big marketplaces as being sort of savior for their businesses. It's going to increase and introduce a lot of parcels to their, to their network, which for the most part it has. They've created a lot of yep. volume. Yep. Uh, for postal operators, but in turn, they've also become competitors. Yeah. So they have their own delivery network, um, which means, yeah, I mean, you know, who was friends and now foe in some respects in some cases, but we still work with them and they're still very important to us. But I mean, to your question, I think the other, so that's one big change that's yeah, happened. Yeah. The other big change that's happened is, and particularly over the last sort of four or five years, is so many new startups in the parcel space. So many new, and they come with and very, a very lot deep. Of software. They come yeah. with a lot of software. They come with a lot of agility, they yeah. come without the history, and they, and most importantly, they come with very, very deep pockets from VC and PE funds. That makes life incredibly challenging. So, like I said earlier, and in, and in the spirit of honesty, it is a really competitive space at the moment, but, but also, as I said, I don't know that that race is really finished. I think there's a few more twists and turns to come there in terms of whether, whether you know, whether the marketplaces will continue to provide logistics long-term. I mean, some struggle with it, some do quite well with it. Uh, whether those, PE funded companies will be around in three or four years. I think there's still plenty of twists and turns. So from our perspective, and we focus on what we can control, we just focus on having the very, very best service level yep. that we possibly can. And, and I'm very pleased to say that Post Malaysia has a 96% on time uh, success rate, which is the best in Malaysia. So if you provide the best that you can, and you ship, you've got a chance of winning that customer's heart. Yeah, and that, that's our job. Absolutely, and people yeah. tend to be brand loyal. Yeah. Um, in your time, I, I, again, I'm an avid follower of you and Post Malaysia. You. I love the human element. Um, you win a lot of awards yeah. in HR. I won't go down that path, but you can tell it's kind of a happy environment. Maybe I'm hitting on it or maybe I'm not. What do you consider personally your biggest win in the three years that you've been there? Like. I think I think you know this is a big Post Malaysia is a big organisation. We have nearly eighteen thousand employees, and as I mentioned earlier, covering a range of different um, activities. You know, really, really is very, very, very diverse. And when you're trying to transform a, a company that's got two hundred year history, eighteen thousand employees, you imagine the biggest ship you can, and try to move it with agility is quite tough. And I'm really, really, pl I'm pleased and proud with how far Post Malaysia has come in a very, very short yeah. time. When I first walked in in August 2021, and back to that service comment, our service wasn't very good. And that's like going, you know, as we're in Malaysia, that's like going to a Nasi Lemak shop and you order, you know, it looks fantastic, the lighting's fantastic, the signage is fantastic, and you order the Nasi Lemak and the rice is hard, yep. you don't go back because that's their core business. For us, the core business is delivering your parcel on time. Yeah. So for us, making that transition very quickly from having, honestly, substandard service level to now having the best service level in Malaysia is something I, I will remember for a very long time. It's not usual. It's very unusual to make that change that quickly. And that's not me. That's 18,000 really great people here. Yeah. And motivating them. Yeah, Like absolutely. motivating, to your point. You Absolutely. Know, um, which leads me into my next question. 
Which leads me to my next question about sustainability, mm -hmm. which you are specifically here sure. at uh, Logi Sim speaking about. I am um, in particularly interested in in the comment about telematics. Now, yeah. I'm going to say this because telematics takes me back to my days where I was running trucks and, yeah. and operations, and we did it for those reasons of safety. Yeah. Uh, it was Australia, safety, safety, chain of responsibility. Yeah. But you tied it into sustainability. Absolutely. Could you just briefly for our audience Absolutely. run through that again? Because that is a fascinating twist on an old an old concept yeah, yeah. of technology. Well, I, th I think it, I think it, it, it does two things. Uh, and the reason we pivot and talk about sustainability when talking about telematics, two reasons. One, there is a little bit of sort of fear around telematics from the driver's perspective. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know? So Big and brother. not so much in Asia, but definitely in the US, yeah. definitely in Australia, definitely in Western Europe. If you go out and say, hey, we're putting telematics on you, you have a lot of problems with all sorts of different people because absolutely. they think you're you know, big brother, as you said, watching. Union, union gets correct, involved, correct. absolutely. So it, can, it can be, and I think, that's a fa I think it's fair. I think that's a fair worry. I personally, it's not why I would do it, but I, I understand why some would be concerned yep. from that perspective. So I think pivoting and moving it more towards, okay, this is about driving behavior. So A, having a more sustainable footprint. Yep. Uh, so, you know, um, when I was in Canada, we did the same thing at Canada Post. And uh, we found that a huge amount of our emissions were created from idling. Uh, so in Canada, a different problem to here, they have cold and so they keep the engine running to keep the heat going so when they get out and do a delivery, they'll leave the engine on quite often or they're at lights or parked or whatever it may be. They'll keep it on to keep the engine, so to keep the cabin warm. And here in Malaysia, they do the reverse, they keep it on because they want to keep the aircon on or they just forget. But that idling is about 20% of all CO2 emissions that are created out of a vehicle. So it's, it's really significant um, as well as burning money. I mean, it's, it's a big cost element too. So idling, driving behavior, accelerating too fast, cornering too fast, all of those aspects have a huge impact on the sustainable position of that vehicle. So that's where we tend to focus on, that's why we're doing it, we're doing it from there. But to your point, you know, the second sort of uh, pillar that we use and talk about when we talk about telematics is, is safety. And yeah. safety for us is our number one pillar. It's not, it's not negotiable. You know, people come in alive, I want them to go home alive, you know, and I, in, in my three years in, in Malaysia, I've had to ring three families to tell them that their husband has died on their way to work, so not in work, but on their way to work, uh, or on their way home on a motorbike, and it is the most horrible thing to do to tell a mother or wife that your yeah. husband has passed away. And so, so safety for us is really, really, really key thing. So if telematics makes us an nth better yep. uh, in terms of safety, so driving behavior, again, speeding, whatever it may be, just makes us a little bit better in terms of how well we operate that vehicle and also the vehicle's conditions. So telematics will also tell us when we need to replace parts, even though we do all sorts of manual checks, you can't substitute for good telematic information to tell you, okay, that wheel tire needs changing or that oil needs changing, whatever else. So absolutely has a really positive impact in terms of our sustainability journey, given. And secondly, and possibly even more important, is about the safety of our drivers. It's really, really important to me. I am so excited to hear that. I mean, this is, this is maybe bringing my age out again, but it's nice to see a tried and trusted technology uh, being resurrected yeah. in the new environment of sustainability, and ESG, yeah. and, and green requirements. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, today, the things that Telematics does and can tell us as operators, uh, you know, it's really advanced even further still. We have teams of people that yep. go through this data on a regular, looking for opportunities to improve that situation. It makes a massive difference here. Absolutely. Mm. All right, and, and I'll, I'll get ready to wrap here. Um, do, you, do you have any final words for the Logisim audience or, or your time here at Logisim so before we? It's been a while since I managed to speak at Logisim. So <laughs> I think this is, I think about three or four years. So actually oh, it's really excellent. nice to reconnect. And that's why, I mean, you know, these events, you know, it's nice to have somebody on stage or whatever else. But for me, it's more about connecting with people. people. That are, this, this is a, you know, as you know, logistics itself is a fairly insular environment, and so it's really nice to reconnect with people I haven't seen for some time and meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Charles. You're I welcome, hope Marianne. to see you around thank again. You I will thank continue you. to uh, stalk you on the old LinkedIn, and uh, you have a good day. Enjoy the rest of your day at Lodgy. Thank you very much. Thank you.